Well, ladies and gentlemen, the subject of today's webinar is separating the reality from the rhetoric in connection with China. So welcome to this, the first joint webinar between the Asia Scotland Institute and the Defence and Security Forum. I'm Roddy Gow, founder of the Institute, of whose International Advisory Council, Lady Olga Maitland, founder of the Defence and Security Forum, is also a member. At a time of heightened tensions with China, we are going to examine the UK's relationship with that country, a subject very much aligned with the Asia Scotland Institute's mission, which is to increase understanding of Pan-Asia and educate and inspire tomorrow's leaders in Scotland through equipping them with greater knowledge of the region. After introducing our panelists, I will hand over to Olga, who will set the scene before asking each member of the panel to comment on the topic of China trade. We will then open up the floor to the large number of participants and followers to enable some of them to ask questions in a session moderated by the Institute's director, Doug Cook. And at the end of the webinar, I'll conclude the proceedings. This discussion is being recorded and will be made available to the public after the event. And now to our panelists. Lady Olga Maitland is the founder of the Defence and Security Forum, which she created in 1983. It was originally a campaigning organisation known as Families for Defence, launched to challenge the anti-nuclear protest movements such as CND. Families for Defence remit was to promote the NATO case for multilateral nuclear disarmament. Olga has been a journalist and she was also a member of parliament for Sutton and Cheam between 1992 and 1997. She's now also very active with the Algeria British Business Council. So Sherard Cooper Coles is the chairman of the China British Business Council, CBBC. He's group head of government affairs at HSBC and director of HSBC Europe. He was previously business development director international at BAE Systems after a career of more than 30 years in the British diplomatic service including time spent as ambassador to Israel, Saudi Arabia and Afghanistan, and a UK special representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan between 2009 and 2010. He was principal private secretary to the UK foreign secretary and head of the foreign office Hong Kong department from 1994 until the handover to China in 1997 and is the author of Cables from Kabul. He was educated at Hartford College, Oxford, where he read classics. Still staying with Oxford, Professor Rana Mitta is a British historian and political scientist who specializes in the history of Republican China. He's professor of the history and politics of modern China at the Department of Politics and International Relations at Oxford University, Deutsche Bank director of the Dixon Poon China Center and a fellow and vice master of St. Cross College. He was educated at King's College, Cambridge, where he received both his MA and PhD, and in 1999 was elected president of the Cambridge Union. He was also a Kennedy Scholar at Harvard University, and on the 16th of July, 2015, was elected a Fellow of the British Academy. And last, but by no means least, Professor Steve Tang. He is a political scientist and historian whose expertise includes politics and governance in China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. The foreign and security policies of China and Taiwan, and peace and security in East Asia. He is the current director of the SOAS China Institute, one of the world leading centres for China expertise located in London. Born in Hong Kong, he received a BA at the University of Hong Kong in 1981 and a DPhil at St Anthony's College, Oxford. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are very lucky to have assembled such a distinguished panel today. And now I I am delighted to hand over to Lady Olga to address China separating the reality from the rhetoric. Well, thank you, Roddy, very much indeed for that introduction. But I'd also like to thank you and uh, Asia Scotland Institute for making this dialogue uh, possible. The reason why I felt keenly that we needed to try and explore fact from fiction is that there have really has been an increasing phobia about China over the last six months. It's been led possibly from the neocons in America, but it's been picked up here in Europe and in Britain in particular. And the, it's a far cry 
from 2015, when the then Prime Minister David Cameron went to China with George Osborne. At that time, there was great optimism about a non, you know, an entente and a country we could do business with. We've moved from that to China being rather described as a malignant state of utterly dubious moral intentions. And with it, of course, has become the trade war between uh, America and China, with many words and many uh, actions taking place, leaving countries in Europe and in the UK slightly as a big in the middle, wondering how do we go forward? Now, from the British perspective, here we are going through the last phase of leaving the European Union by December the 31st. We're on our own and our relationships worldwide are really critical. So we have to define and refine exactly what Britain's role in the global world will be and how do we position ourselves. Obviously, we want to protect and defend UK's interests and also we should consider how positive and active forms of mutually beneficial interaction and exchange can take place. Well, that's easier said than done when some countries are deemed to be more kind of a pariah state than another, depending on which perspective you take. Hence, there is an enormous scope for the framework of a UK-China engagement strategy, which I know that our panelists have been looking at. There are a couple of things that we ought to look at just to put things into context. China is the UK's fifth trading partner. The, this is only one third of the levels that we trade with America. And the foreign direct investment into the UK largely is US and European Union led. We, European Union leads as our trading partner. So China as a major trading partner is still to grow. However, it is a country which has gone through enormous growth. Like all of us, it's somewhat uh, sunk because of the COVID, but undoubtedly it's a massive power and a trading partner. We ought to have a proper working relationship, but we're now hit by a lot of rhetoric, a lot of information and misinformation, and indeed some quite understandable tensions, like for instance, the China-Australia war of words, well, because uh, Australia has now had their trade on barley uh, blocked by China because of their call for a proper investigation about the origins of COVID. So the, there are a lot of geopolitical issues and we're in the middle of it. Now, I would like to turn to our panelists to ask you to help us feel our way through as to how we really have a working relationship bearing in mind our future position in the world. So therefore I'd like to call upon Sir Sherrod, who has enormous experience, both as a diplomat, which I think is critical, and also understanding the business position. Sir Sherrod, perhaps you might give some reflections. How can Britain define ourselves in our relationship with China with all these geopolitical tensions? Well, thank you, Olga, and thank you, Roddy. I think there's no more important subject for us to be discussing today uh, than the place of China in the world and the way in which uh, post-Brexit global Britain will relate to China. And I'm very grateful to you for putting together this uh, webinar today. As you also said, I think that there's nothing straightforward about dealing with China. And the first point I would make as chair of the council which promotes the economic and commercial relationship between Britain and China is that we should beware of simple binary choices. That is the road to perdition. Uh, we have to, as Joe and Lai said, uh, find common ground where we can uh, while acknowledging our differences, whether they're over Hong Kong or Xinjiang or the South China Sea or whatever it may be. I remember when I was a diplomat in the British Embassy in Washington, the ambassador at the time saying that uh, it was very unusual if we didn't have four major transatlantic rows running with the Americans at any one time. And the job of a great country like Britain uh, after Brexit is to find a mature relationship with China in which we seek out in the British interest uh, which we will need more than ever after COVID, after Brexit, 
jobs, investment, students, 200,000 Chinese students at British universities, a 30% rise in applications since, the, uh, since before the crisis, uh, tourists, etc., etc., maximizing our self-interest uh, while being grown up enough to be able to differ about issues that are not important to us. Uh, that are not directly related to the uh, economic relationship. Now, I would uh, also say that uh, a second principle is to take the world not um, as we would wish it to be, uh, but as it is, and seek to influence it by, uh, in a practical and pragmatic way, where by engaging where we can, uh, the 200,000 Chinese students at British universities are an important uh, point of access and influence for the future and investment in the future of that relationship. Now, um, Olga, you gave some figures about the relationship, but in fact, they're out of date. Uh, China is now Britain's third largest trading partner. And um, uh, about the level of Chinese investment in the UK, uh, we, and the UK, uh, before COVID, received more uh, investment from China than all the other countries of the European Union put together. Uh, it is about uh, half that we receive from the United States. So it's a very big, very important economic, commercial, cultural, intellectual relationship. 400,000 uh, Chinese um, tourists visited Britain um, before the crisis broke. And in many areas of the newest technologies, whether it's uh, battery technology for cars, high-speed rail, uh, China has already overtaken the West. So some of the rather hysterical talk in America about China stealing our intellectual property is in fact outdated. Uh, they should be concerned about us taking advantage of their intellectual property. So against that background, I would urge everyone, and we all feel strongly about tele television images from Xinjiang or Hong Kong, to think carefully about what is in the interests of post-Brexit Britain. And what is in the interests of post-Brexit Britain is to engage with one of the world's greatest and oldest civilizations, a country, as Rana will tell us, that suffered hugely at the hands of the West, from whom uh, we seized the territory of Hong Kong. Imagine how we would have reacted if France had seized the Isle of Wight and held it for more than a hundred years, uh, and um, seized the, the territory of Hong Kong and much else, uh, made a lot of money out of sending opium to China. And China is now, in its view, regaining its rightful place in the world. And we need to acknowledge that and work with it. And remember that this, this vast country is more than the Communist Party. And remember too that the Communist Party is an org organization of 90 million people. Uh, that is in fact uh, the system of government for running the country. So those who say uh, they don't have a quarrel uh, with the Chinese people, uh, just a quarrel with the Chinese Communists, are in fact saying that they don't want to deal with modern China. And I think that is a very dangerous, a very rash uh, path for uh, post-Brexit Britain to be going down. So I'd end where I began by saying, uh, look at this, uh, acknowledge this relationship to be as complicated, as difficult uh, as it is. Uh, don't fall for the simple black and white solutions of the neocons. Uh, don't, um, dehumanize the Chinese people by uh, thinking them uh, all the same, that they're incapable of independent thought, that they're incapable of an int intellectual inquiry. Engage with them, profit from them, subject to strict national security requirements uh, where necessary, but above all, maximize our influence. And remember too, at a time when America is withdrawing from the world, if we want to solve the problem of climate change. If we want to solve many of the world's other problems, we cannot do so without China as a fellow member of the UN Security Council. And putting up the barriers with China is just 
dealing ourselves out of the game and doing extraordinary um, self-harm uh, in economic terms, in terms of jobs across the whole of the United Kingdom without any obvious net benefit uh, to the people of the United Kingdom. So engage, but engage with our eyes wide open in the British interest is my message. So, Shara, thank you very much indeed. And I think that your telling point about engaging with the eyes wide open is probably critical to the whole relationship as we move forward. Now, I'd like to turn to Professor Rana Mitter from Oxford. Um, Professor Rana, you're very welcome with us. We'll, you're very well known. And I wonder whether you'd like to pick up from Sir Sherrod's broad view about how should Britain engage with China in the future caught with almost a blackmail situation between the Russia, uh, with, between the America and uh, China uh, trade wars. We are in a difficult position. Thank you, Rana. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Olga. And it's a great pleasure having read about you many times in the newspapers during my Cold War childhood, which is some years ago uh, uh, now, to actually have a chance to interact with you and your organization in, in, in person. It brings back many uh, memories of when I was younger and I think thinner as, as well. Um, I'm going to essentially make one point, although I'm going to take a couple of minutes to, uh, to make it. And it absolutely picks up on the very wise, sensible comments unexpectedly, uh, what's the word, un unsurprisingly um, sensible comments from long experience that Sherard has just given us. And that was a very, very uh, helpful starting point. I'm also going to start shamelessly, I'm afraid, if I may, with, with a plug, because um, over the last couple of days, I've had a couple of um, outings on Radio 4 of a documentary I made called Meanwhile in Beijing, still available on BBC Sounds, uh, the, uh, the new name for the iPlayer for radio. And if you have time and inclination, do have a, have a listen, because within it, I think I managed to get together a range of voices from the most fire-breathing Chinese nationalist friend I could find on one end, and one of the most thoughtful and critical British voices on China at the other end, with plenty in between. And the reason I bring that up is A, hoping you'll listen to it, B, st stressing one particular word that Sherard used, which is the word complexity, understanding that any relationship between Britain and China is not actually about one voice, it's about a whole multiplicity of voices with different in some cases equally valid but different views about what's uh, what's going on and also just in case you don't rush immediately after this to the iPlayer to, uh, to, to, to listen to it one particular line that I wanted to stress and I think this this gets to the heart of what we're talking about today when we talk about China's relationship with Britain and the Chinese in Britain they are not an abstraction as I said in that program they are our students they are business executives they're tourists they are um, friends, they are wives, they are husbands, they are all sorts of people who are actually in our lives in a way that I think was not true for many other countries with whom we've had difficult relations over a longer period of time. That's to do with the increasing smallness of the world through technology, air travel, all the things we used to enjoy before COVID. Um, just a reminder that it's not just a them and us situation. But that having been said, I wanted to get to this point, particularly about trade at the center and think about what we, as we've been pointing out in a post-Brexit environment, need to be thinking about. And I think the best thing we can do is talk to some people who've been there already. I mean, in a sense we have, as, as we've heard from both Olga and Sherrod, China is climbing up the, the scale as a, an economic and trade partner for the, the UK. But I found it very instructive to talk to people from two particular countries, which have had, I think, um, a long experience of doing trade and also having a prickly, but in the end, I think, overall productive relationship with China, and that is Germany and Australia. Let me speak about Germany briefly first, if I may, because I think of all countries in Europe, and by the way, you won't um, have to look too far to find my own personal views on this question by saying that I still consider Britain very much to be in Europe, regardless of its current political arrangements. Germany of all the European countries, I think, has had probably the deepest most complex, in some ways most productive relationship with China. That's partly to do with one particular coincidence. Uh, well, coincidence is not quite the right word, but one particular happenstance. And that's the fact that Germany's economy, as many on this call will know better than I have, has a Mittelstand, it has a whole variety of manufacturing industries going from the middle to the major size, you know, the Siemens and so forth of this world, and smaller, um, more federally based uh, companies that have particular advantages for the stage of development that China was at in the 1980s through to the early 2000s. 
So there was a trade advantage that was slightly different since um, uh, under the party that I think Olga used to represent at one point, large parts of our manufacturing industry seemed to disappear, but I'm not blaming you personally, Olga. I, I don't hold a grudge. Um, and as I'll go on to say in a minute, we may have something else up our sleeve, which uh, no doubt also came from that earlier earlier period. But the point is that by making that relationship to do with manufacturing industry in a very pragmatic way, Germany was able and is able to build up a relationship with China that is both friendly and when it needs to be very frank. I think it is often said and I think rightly that Angela Merkel is one of the few top leaders in uh, Europe who can essentially get on the phone to uh, Xi Jinping and his people um, and um, have a frank conversation. I've had a question coming up, by the way, just asking for the name of that Radio 4 program mentioned. It's called Meanwhile in Beijing. Uh, it's not just on Radio 4 and it's easily available on, on BBC Sound. Um, so to return to the question of Germany, I think that in some ways the ability to have both a broad and deep relationship has created the kinds of figures who we need more of. So I'm thinking, I'm going to name a name here and I'll, I'll say it in, in public and you know here because I think he deserves to be named. Uh, Jörg Wittke, a BASF, known as one of the major corporate executives who spent, you know, a working lifetime in Beijing. He can and does talk on Chinese television. He can talk to Chinese leaders. His views are extremely well known and very well respected. He is not in any sense someone who simply listens and s says yes please to anything that China says. He has robust conversations, but they are based on knowledge, they're based on experience, they're based on length of time, and having more figures like that would be a really great addition to that sense of Britain going out to trade seriously with China in the near future. And the frankness, as well as the friendliness, are both part of that equation. You can't have one without the other. Now, I'm not saying there aren't lots of um, uh, very brilliant executives uh, for the British side in China today who actually have a very good relationship with Chinese counterparts. I'll spare their blushes by perhaps not naming them, them here. But I think anyone of that kind of level of prominence of your Wirtke is someone we need to be working towards. So that's one, one tip I think I, I'd give. I'll finish with speaking about Australia because I think that's a more difficult case and we need to bring up difficult cases to talk about you know, where things might go wrong and how we need to think in advance about where we have red lines that we really want to say thus far and no further. Without going into huge details, you may know them or you can find them out. There have been difficulties in the Australian-Chinese trade relationship to do with the related politics. So um, China may be now our third biggest partner, but of course for Australia, China is number one and it's about 33% of China's total trade, uh, largely to do with a whole variety of ores, minerals and so forth that are being dug out of the ground and shipped off to, uh, to China and its amazing um, uh, industrial uh, economy. But there have been difficulties. Australia did decide quite early on to say no to Huawei. And let's just think for a moment, who in Australia said no to Huawei? Well, it was a man known in China as Lu Kerwen. In other words, Kevin Rudd the fluent Mandarin speaking prime minister at the time of Australia, who is still a frequent visitor to Beijing, knows many of the leadership very well. He's of course left office some years ago, but still very much a figure in that Australian Chinese world. And again, the kind of figure who in global terms, let alone British terms, I wish we had more of. In other words, people who know that world can speak again, frankly, fluently, and hey, in Putonghua as well, if you can possibly manage it, to say, look, there are certain things where we're absolutely straight down the line, we need to trade, we need to talk about climate change, we need to talk about big pictures about what happens when the Americans decide temporarily, I think, to, to leave the room, but they, they will be back, just a question of, of when. But also there are certain things, sticking to the joint declaration on Hong Kong, not, some, uh, not uh, allowing lawyers and uh, dissident writers to be wiped off the internet by censors or picked up in their homes and arrested, all these sorts of things that is perfectly legitimate for us to say, Actually, we don't like that. Just as we told the United States, I hope, back in the 50s and 40s and 50s, that discriminating against their own African-American citizens was not um, uh, allowed. And by the way, I always like to point out to my Chinese friends that the People's Republic of China hosted, amongst other people, Paul Robeson, other prominent uh, African-Americans who quite rightly were fighting against racial discrimination. So not always the case that China decides not to uh, interfere in other countries' internal uh, affairs. But those are the sort of conversations we need to keep having, sometimes sternly, sometimes with a smile on our face, but always sticking to our own values, which I am happy to call liberal values in the wider sense, uh, sense of that term, but always understanding that China is and will be part of our global world, value system and economy, 
for a very long time to come. We can't ignore it, we can't contain it, we can't pretend it's not there. But we must make sure that our conversation is civilized, friendly, and at all times, very, very frank. Okay, I'll leave that thought there, Olga. I'm sure there'll be plenty of discussion afterwards. Rana, thank you very, very much indeed. And I do take upon, take very strongly your comment about looking at the way that Germany uh, managed their relationship with China. And I think it's something we'll learn more from. I'm sure you're right. We should be talking to more people who have direct hands-on knowledge and experience. Now, on that merry note, with great pleasure, I turn to Professor Stephen Stang uh, from SOAS, uh, the China Center there. Now, um, uh, Professor Zhang uh, comes from Hong Kong. No one could be closer to the show than that. And I know that uh, the professor will have his own insights. How can we have a meaningful relationship with China without being caught in a tangle of web and complications geopolitically? Over to you, uh, Professor um, Stephen Zhang. Well, thank you very much, Olga. It's been a great pleasure to be on this um, webinar. Um, I think you are absolutely right that we are being caught in between two superpowers who are pulling in different directions. But there is one thing where they are both pulling in the same direction, but with opposite effect. And that is pulling in the direction of e-coupling. And I think we often do see Decoupling as something started in particular by the Trump administration, probably mostly last year when Trump pushed very hard for that. Um, reality is that the Chinese government under Xi Jinping has been pushing in that direction as well. And if anything, Xi Jinping been preparing for some kinds of decoupling even before Trump became president of the United States. I think it would go all the way back to 2013, the year after Xi Jinping became leader, or in the first year of his time as General Secretary of the Communist Party, when he issued document number nine, by which he banned certain specific Western concepts, whether we're talking about constitutionalism, civil society, universal values, or and and similar types of ideas. They were all being banned in China, including Chinese universities. And of course, the big in China 2025 uh, industrial strategy was to try to make sure that China would not have to be dependent on the West, particularly the United States, for critical technologies. Now, this also makes a lot of sense for China. But that direction of travel is happening. And we are, in a sense, being caught into it. I think the point that uh, Sora made earlier about engaging with China with, with eyes wide open is a very important one. We have to see that it is actually happening, but we also have to be very pragmatic and true to what we are. And we should not forget that the United Kingdom has never tried to cut off economic relationship with China even when relationships were extremely difficult. And if we go all the way back to 1949, 1950, when, when British investments in China were being squeezed out, British policy was still proactive, uh, positive engagement of China. We did not go the direction of the United States. When the British embassy in Beijing was burned down uh, in 67 during the Cultural Revolution, we, should, we continue to try to engage with the uh, Chinese government under Mao Zedong. So if we could engage with China in 49, 50, 51, when the world was en uh, engulfed with the conflict of the Korean War and its ramifications, and China was engulfed in the Cultural Revolution in the 60s, then I don't see something which is happening now that is so bad that we have to change that and stop engaging with China. Um, but that engagement means that we do have to understand where the Chinese government is coming from, where it's going for, 
and how we in that process protect what are important to us. What are important to us are obviously the economic relationship, but also our basic core values. We do believe in our value and our system, and that is important in terms of how we uh, do that. Um, over this, I think Hong Kong does come into the picture, whether we like it or not, Hong Kong is going to be very much up the political agenda between the UK and China uh, in the coming year and perhaps a bit beyond. But again, our objective over Hong Kong is not to go, off, go to some kind of a confrontation with, the, with China just for the sake of it. It is to ensure that the sino british Agreement of 1984 were being protected, that Hong Kong can continue to operate in a way that it was supposed to, and that will be beneficial to the interests of both UK and the people of China, and of course the people of Hong Kong. Uh, so we do have to do something, but we can be doing it in a way that is positively engaging. Uh, over to you. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Stephen Tang. I'd like to ask a question, though, following on that, about how we do continue with these engagements. Because, for example, the Huawei uh, issue has really now taken a yet another lurch forward with the pressure from Washington on the uh, Prime Minister here to uh, change his mind about giving the 5G uh, masks to Huawei. Now, um, I think to a certain extent that's a real pity, but how is Boris going to get out of that logjam? Because the more that happens that Washington says, if you want to trade with us, you can't trade uh, with China over Huawei and one thing or another. This kind of picking things out of the bag and doing what suits them. How do we navigate that particularly difficult path? I put that question back to uh, the Professor um, Zhang. I think when we are dealing with something like Huawei, our primary consideration would be what really would be best for the UK. Um, if after all the judgments that allowing Huawei really is in the best interest of the United Kingdom, then we should allow Huawei to be part, uh, taking part. But whether that is in the best interest of the UK is something that I think we should uh, discuss um, much more. Um, the fact that when the news was being leaked or released a couple, a couple of days ago that the government here may be rethinking about Huawei and immediately we have the China Daily coming out with a very strong statement saying that if that should happen there will be a price for UK to pay. It's something that I think really gets me actually rather uncomfortable. I think when we are looking at a company like Huawei what we have to be understanding is that it really doesn't matter whether Huawei is a private company or whether it's a state-owned enterprise. What matters is whether that company or any company, any Chinese company, is being seen by the Chinese government as so important that every single uh, instrument of Chinese diplomacy or other kind of pressure will be applied to advance the interests of that company. If it happens, then I think we need to think about the relationship of that company with uh, the Chinese party state. And it's, it, would, it would appear that on this occasion, that question was being raised by the action of the Chinese government. Well, that's a very difficult one. I wonder whether, Sir Sherrod, you might have a view. Yes, I, I do have a view. And I'm afraid I rather disagree with Steve on this. <laughs> I mean, I think that, um, the view of the government communications headquarters, GCHQ, and the National Cyber Security Center that subject to strict safeguards, uh, it is perfectly acceptable to have Huawei supply equipment for the non-core elements of the UK 5G network is a sensible and the right decision. As I said earlier, it's taken in the British interest with our eyes wide open, subject to strict security safeguards. And I think we need to realize that coming from a country that used to bug the German Chancellor's telephone, 
uh, mobile <laughs> telephone and insists that its own companies put back doors in all their equipment that they supply to third countries. I've seen for myself how the Americans steal data from around the world. Um, I think it's very hypocritical for them to claim, you know, companies like IBM, like Microsoft, have had, Boeing, had huge support from the American state. Uh, so no doubt as Huawei had from the Chinese state, but I don't think that should be a reason for not doing business with them. The reason should be uh, for doing business, is it in the British interest? And I believe subject to strict security safeguards, it's overwhelmingly in the British interest that we have the most modern 5G equipment we can uh, in the best time scale possible. Now, I just wanted to make another point, which is that in all this, um, as you rightly said, as Steve acknowledges, they, these are very difficult issues. They're not black and white, which is why I would like Britain to have a long term, grown up, mature, multi strand uh, strategy towards China that doesn't change every five minutes when a group of backbenchers gets worked up about one issue or another, but says that Britain is a major power. We're going to engage with another major power, China. We're going to disagree with some issues, but in our own mutual interest, we're going to work together on those interests where we have, uh, where we can both benefit. And as uh, Rana said, I think one of the biggest of those interests is our role in educating young Chinese people for the future. And they want to come to the best British universities. They want to sit at the feet of people like Professors Chang and Mitter and learn about the world. And I think we should welcome them with open arms uh, in, our, uh, in our mutual benefit as a long-term investment in this relationship as part of a sensible, robust China strategy that's ruggedized against short-term shocks. Well, thank you very much indeed, Sharon. I'd now like to turn to another question and then we will open up the floor. Is it realistic to break the production chain with China and why? There's been a big discussion about uh, can we rely on China, uh, can we not diversify, can we not indeed move away to other places? Well, bearing in mind, almost half our household goods have made in China written on the back of them. It's quite a big call. Um, is it realistic and why? Um, perhaps we move over to Professor Rana Mitter on this one. Um, thank you, Olga. Um, I think to some extent, well, first of all, the direct answer to your question is no, I don't think it's wholly realistic to have some kind of complete decoupling in the way that President Trump uh, keeps talking about. Uh, that's when he's not accusing uh, chat show hosts of having committed murder and various other intriguing things that have come through his Twitter feed in the, in the last few, uh, few, few months. Um, but the idea that China, the second biggest economy in the world, can wholly be removed from the entire um, economic uh, uh, ecology of the rest of the world is, is clearly not, uh, uh, not feasible. I think that we have to put the question in a slightly different way because actually, in some ways, I mean, the point you just made, Olga, is absolutely accurate right up to now and will be for a while in terms of uh, you know shirts or uh, uh, washing machines or you know, whatever else it, it might be the kind of commodity market which actually was very much tied to that German uh, connection that I mentioned earlier but that's not the direction that China's going one of the things that is most notable for anyone who goes to China I think many in this conversation do so as business people or teachers or whatever else it might be on a fairly regular basis is that China is inexorably moving towards a much more high, high value added economy. And I think that COVID-19, which we haven't actually mentioned yet, but you know, got to come into the conversation somewhere, is probably going to accelerate some of those trends. I say that partly because, again, without taking up a huge amount of, of, of airspace, just one particular thing. If you look at the figures in China for the rise in the amount of e-business being done, which was already huge proportionate to many other uh, economies, because everyone had to be locked indoors and in lockdown in, in January and February, it's gone through the roof. In all fairness, we should say that 
The other piece of e-business that was going on in China during much of those months, as you know, Steve, I'm sure, will know as well, was lots of people complaining about Dr. Li Wenliang uh, dying of the coronavirus and then uh, being basically you know, forced to uh, recant his words before he uh, died, which became a really big issue on the Chinese internet. And I, I bring those two examples up to show that the Chinese internet can do all sorts of things. It can be sometimes a vehicle for actually its own citizens complaining uh, about China until you know, they're told to, to, to cool it. It's also one of the hugest economic engines anywhere in the world. You know, the singles day that Alibaba.com uh, organizes each year, I think in November of each year, is the single biggest sales event anywhere in the world. And you can't have that kind of phenomenon going on and saying that that simply decouples from the rest of the world. So I think the key question actually is not whether we can separate from China, but as Sherrod's pointed out, that you know, we need to, to start really thinking now strategically about it is, how do we engage with the reality that China will continue to be a very big economy for a very long time, that it will be in the forefront, not always at the cutting edge, sometimes the hype is bigger than the reality, but in the forefront of areas that will be the next phase of development, including electronic business. And then how do we use our own advantages in the UK as a very heavily service-based economy, which didn't help us so much in the 90s and 2000s, but actually could be a source of advantage uh, now, particularly, actually, I have to say, I'm aware of, we're talking to the Asia Scotland Group and Scotland's um, services sector in particular, I think, financial services and elsewhere has a lot specifically to offer in, in, in this area. Think about that, how, how that fits in without ever becoming beholden or dependent on China, as we wish not to do, I think, with any other country, uh, country either, but recognizing that coexistence and um, you know, mutual growth is clearly very important. Dependency is a very worrying prospect. The Chinese know that. They basically have spent the last 150 years making sure they are not dependent uh, in an absolute sense of any other country. We should be the same. I must ask uh, Professor Stephen Tang for a quick response about the um, breaking or not the production chain when so much business is dependent upon it. Where do you, th where do you stand on that? And break all the supply chains with China, it is not realistic and it is not what, how this country operates uh, and we shouldn't be engaged with that. But having said that, I think we also have to be realistic that this global supply chain is changing anyway. And, and, and China is changing so fast that a lot of what we saw, say, five years ago as the norm of the supply chain are no longer uh, true today because some of those manufacturings are not being made in China any longer. They are shifting some of those manufacturing outside of China. And this is a fairly normal process. It's part of that way how the world <laughs> develops and changes and how some of the manufacturing gets shipped around the world. Uh, we shift them all to China at one stage and now China is at the process of upgrading its economy and shifting some of the um, everyday goods, uh, everyday use consumer products for, into manufacturing somewhere else. So I don't think we need to be overly worried about the supply chain changing. What we need to be thinking is a much more strategic way of seeing whether there are some uh, critical essential uh, goods that we perhaps should think about uh, making sure that they are being produced in places that are very reliable. Uh, globalization, as we know it, is going to change as a result of COVID-19 and we have to be prepared for that. Uh, but that's not to say that we do not continue to engage with China and uh, have economic partnerships with Chinese companies. Thank Please, you thank you. I'm going, to, I'm going to jump in now, Olga, if I may. Okay. I'm conscious of the time. Yes, First of all, yes. talking of time, I, I love the Asian expression, uh, you have the watches, but we have the time. And I think that, that understanding the, the long time frames involved in Asia and the building of relationships and the fact that 200 years ago, the two largest economies in the world were in fact India and China, uh, not much has changed in many respects. But speaking about some of the points that have been raised, um, I'd like to talk a little bit more, get people's views on, on e-commerce. Uh, there is a view that, for example, in Scotland, where I'm speaking from, the e-commerce effort of the Scots is really quite pathetic. There is no e-commerce port um, or facility in Scotland, whereas there are 100 in China. 
and a lot of the small and medium-sized enterprises that, that make up the Scottish economy uh, would benefit it immeasurably from uh, e-commerce, I think. And as has been mentioned by the panelists, the amount of online ordering of goods and services that's going on is, is quite remarkable. And I wonder if, Rana, you could comment on that. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think that one of the things that is really worth thinking about, bearing in mind that the, the heart of this conversation is about UK-China trade and where it's going to go. And I often do think, I'm sure that many of you on this call will be sympathetic to the idea that when people are in London, they tend to assume that, or the southeast of England, that tends to be the whole of the uh, uh, of the UK. And of course, that's an immensely misleading way of thinking about it. In a different context, actually, as I'm sure many of you will know, Northern Ireland has been actually a place of great interest to uh, China for quite some time, not least actually because it has disproportionately high, in a good way, um, diaspora China, Chinese community there as well. As anyone who's seen the uh, a British Chinese character in Derry Girls will, uh, will know. Uh, so coming up to this question of, as you put it, the way in which the development of a more service-based economy can take advantage of the differences and divergences that we have in our own economy, I think that what we have to do here is some matching up. We have A, a country that you know, whether people like it or not, has, has left the European Union, is going to be thrust into something else. We don't know quite what it is in just a few uh, months' uh, months' time. And then is also given a great many advantages, many of which is often doesn't seem to be self-aware of or isn't doing enough, I think, to, to promote. So the sense that having service, you know, the service sector that we actually have, the actually existing one, as opposed to a sort of fantasy one that exists in the UK, revved up to a much higher level and trying to work out how it can actually provide in the areas that we do do extremely well, financial services, legal services, creative media, which actually is, again, something that Scotland has a particular, I think, um, uh, expertise in, often not appreciated in the rest of the UK, but very real, as those of you who consume Scottish media will, will know. And working out how those can be brought to a Chinese audience is a really important task. Let me finish with one very short anecdote because it just, to me, summed up how regional sectors of the UK might address this conversation. It was a couple of years ago, I was making a program for the BBC, in fact, uh, another Radio 4 series called Chinese Characters. And we were working with a fluent English speaking young Chinese woman in Beijing. And I asked her how her English had got so good and how she seemed to know so much about Middlesbrough not a place that people in the southeast of England necessarily go very much. And it turned out, and I'm ashamed to say I didn't know at the time, that the University of Teesside's Media Studies course, which may be a source of some amusement to people who don't know what Media Studies actually is, it can actually be a very tough and practical course, um, is very well regarded amongst many young Chinese media creatives who basically want somewhere that's reliable, it's a good reputation, and can train them in things like program, ma program making as well as the wider area. So, in that area, at least, the number of Chinese students going over to Middlesbrough, I think, is probably one of the major inputs in terms of the local economy. And it's that kind of example that we need to have more of and understand better. I think that learning process is at a very early stage. We need to get it faster, quicker. Rana, thank you. And, and Olga, I know that um, Doug Cook has got a number of questions now from those following us. Um, and if it's OK with you, I think we'll go over to Doug and ask him to um, raise these these questions. Rodney, thank you very much indeed. I'd like to um, open up the questioning first of all to a gentleman called Sebastian Leslie who has a question on um, IPR. Sebastian. The issue of IPR is a major one for, for both large and small companies and I, I would ask you that wonderful comment when Winston leaned across to a cabinet minister and said how do you argue when you're with a tiger when your head is in its mouth? Uh, the reality for me as a, just a, uh, a businessman and a councillor in Scotland is it does appear that Huawei has the most advanced technology and is able to take advantage of that in a malign sense, as Sarah possibly said, or not as the case may be, but they have not respected IPR. Their fast trains are designed on Siemens. The list is endless. So I'd like to ask the, the guys that know about this, how do we in the United Kingdom address that? given that one of the, the points about Huawei, and I totally oppose Huawei, and I did lead the Brexit party in Scotland, so I feel rather like a, a Catholic at the Rangers end and the Rangers and Celtic match. But genuinely, I think it's an extraordinary civilization. My family in Denton Co were with poor old Adam Keswick, who's getting a hard time, but I don't know Adam, but I would say that the 
trading into China in the uh, 19th century did an enormous amount of good. And we got the papers upstairs that actually show that the reason opium was so much increased is the emperor enjoyed his profits. So like a lot of things coming out of China, including the Communist Chinese Party, not all is as it seems. But from the IPR point of view, I'd be very interested to know what your experts say. Uh, and thank you, Doug. Uh, I mean, perhaps, perhaps I could answer that, Sebastian and Doug. I mean, you're quite right to raise the question of protecting intellectual property, Sebastian, and it does need to be protected. And one of the areas in which the China Britain Business Council does a lot for our members is help them when they invest in China or export to China to protect that intellectual property. But we need to remember that the flow goes both ways and that the history of the theft of intellectual property is as low as old as international trade. The United States spent uh, most of the 19th century uh, stealing British intellectual property uh, and uh, quite shamelessly uh, reproducing uh, British inventions without attribution for their own commercial purposes. I just add a point about the export of British intellectual property to China. In two of our most successful exports to China are Peppa Pig, uh, I don't know if, uh, Sebastian, you know who Peppa Pig is, but it's extremely popular. Uh, as, as a grandfather, right across China, I'm an expert. I'm an expert. Good. Grandfather. Well, you probably know the grandfather of Peppa, uh, Peppa's grandfather. And uh, also the Premier League. And you shouldn't undersell Scotland. I mean, Scotland has a huge trade surplus with uh, China, uh, not just in, um, well, in two kinds of amber liquid, uh, the one I expect you'll have a wee dram of this evening, uh, but also the one that comes out of the North Sea. Uh, Scottish shortbread, Scottish culture is c consumed by China on a very large scale and you should be proud of Scotland's record in trading with and exporting to China. And just to pick up on a point made earlier, Britain also has a huge trade surplus for China in services. Our accountants, our lawyers, our consultants, our architects all make very substantial sums out of China alongside the financial services industry. Thank you. Um, I've got another question. I'm going to ask uh, Klaus Sung if he ask his question. Well, thank you, Doug. Uh, I think my question a uh, bit not re related to business part, but more about on educating the young Chinese. Uh, as some of the speaker mentioned about uh, more engagement with China. My question is, uh, if in the past few decades we see the engagement with China, it uh, probably seen make China more assertive and confident uh, uh, for regaining its uh, position, uh, the so-called great nation position in the world politics. How can we see the innovation in the coming decades that would change, uh, like the Chinese understanding of the world, world and uh, its engagement or participation as a supporter of the international rule-based system. Oh, thank you. Perhaps Rana, you could uh, start to address that question. Very briefly on, on, on this question. I would say that China's projection of itself into the world as a great power is moving from what has dominated the way it talks about itself in the world, which is a sort of victim status, which comes in part from highly justified memories of being repeatedly invaded and occupied. The Opium Wars, the Second World War against the Japanese, uh, you know, a whole variety of uh, invasions and occupations, to one that you might call more of a kind of victory discourse. Um, and that is one where I think it's important for the rest of the world to be engaging with China, but also make sure that it understands something that I think is still often not fully understood enough, which is that when you become the second biggest economy in the world, when you become a major geopolitical actor with huge influence, you can't play the victim anymore. You are a leader and you have to act as a leader and you have to learn to take criticism and you have to learn also that people will agree to disagree, not just as a sort of formulaic phrase, but actually genuine welcoming and engagement openly with disagreement rather than trying to shut things uh, down. So I think China's greatness in terms of, and it is a great civilization, has already been expressed in terms of its economic power and its geopolitical influence. Where it is still tiny 
and where it needs to do really serious work is in terms of its soft power, in terms of its ability to project itself as a power, as, as, I, as I say often to, to Chinese friends, including diplomats and people in public life, at the moment, everybody, you know, the vast majority of people respect China, you know, poverty reduction, tech innovation, all those things. But it's still very hard in many cases to feel affection for China when you see what's going on at home, things that China, it's an own goal. I sometimes also say when I'm feeling even more blunt, America is not China's worst enemy, China is. When they get past that, then they will really be able to play the role on the world stage that they're destined for. But that's up to people in Beijing, not people in Washington or London or even Edinburgh. Thank you. And, and Stephen, is there something you'd like to add to this? Happy to add very uh, quickly. The rise of nationalism is, in China is very much a kind of party promoting party-centric nationalism that became the norm after 1989. So this is going to happen whether Chinese students are coming to the UK and elsewhere or not. If we don't embrace Chinese students and engage with them, we are going to see a very, very nationalistic China that is not going to be very friendly to the rest of the world. The more we engage with them seriously, the better that we actually have a chance in getting them to understand why the issues from different perspectives. When Chinese students are being talked, are talking to us in private, certainly from personal experience, some of them do understand where we are, where we are and what we are. Not all of them, but that's what we are here to do in universities, to engage with them and encourage them to think beyond what they are they were being taught back in China by the patriotic education program. Stephen, thank you. Um, and Klaus, thank you for your question. Um, you. Sharon mentioned about developing a, a multi-grand strategy for its engagement with China. And uh, David Orfrey has a, a question building on this. Yes, Doug, thank you for the opportunity. Gosh, it's been an interesting uh, listen to this, uh, this webinar. It's been stunning. Thank you, everybody. Um, I've been out to China on a number of occasions with Doug, actually, with the two, and I too agree that we really do need a strategy with this great country, which um, allows us to continue a path that doesn't flip frock from left to right. How on earth does a country now um, like Britain, with all of the, the democratic ebbing and flowing, and a powerful media and a powerful electorate, how do we develop a grand strategy? I think it needs to be that into the medium and the long term that we might stick to resolutely that gives the Chinese who love the long an opportunity to really see what we're about. And perhaps that strategy needs to go more widely than just China, but also uh, to understand Britain's path in the world, both after COVID and after yeah. Brexit. Um, that's perhaps too big a question on this, uh, at the end of this. No, no. From well, the there's a, David, David, I think it's the most important um, question for post-Brexit global Britain. And as it happens, the government does have the makings of an answer. As you may uh, know, Professor John Bew of King's College London is leading, or will be leading once the COVID crisis subsides, an integrated review of all overseas policy. And I very much hope that uh, that will look at the relationship with China, with America, in the round, with uh, Europe, with uh, all our interests around the world, and try and take a view uh, through the next election, and uh, which will give the government a series of reference points for holding uh, um, to its course when inevitably there are rows over particular issues with particular countries. And I hope that China will be front and center of such a review. And people like uh, Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Tugendhat, MP, say they want such a strategy. So does Nick Timothy, who writes in the Daily Telegraph regularly attacking China. We should take them at their word. And uh, if they are sensible, if they are British patriots, they will realize that it is not in Britain's interest to break entirely with China as some of the more extreme of their fellow travelers, often uh, encouraged by Americans and others, uh, will end up doing. But to have this balanced, multi-strand relationship, 
uh, that in military parlance is ruggedized against shock, um, political shock, and brings benefits to the people of Scotland and the whole of the United Kingdom, as it does to the people of China. Above all, uh, the future generations whom Steve and Rana are helping educate who are the future of that great country. I'm afraid I've got to go to another call now, but I think from my point of view, that integrated, holistic, long-term strategic approach to a great civilization 5,000 years old is what's worthy of a great country like our own. And the small-minded binary black and white uh, approach advocated by some of the Sinophobes is unworthy of great global Britain, in my view. Thank you very much, uh, Sherard. And I think that as you have to go and the clock has reached almost, the, well, it has, it's past the hour, um, it falls to me to really conclude things and thank all of our panelists. I'd like to echo uh, David Orfrey's uh, comments, which are that this has been a very, very interesting, extraordinarily helpful um, discussion uh, involving others. I know there were some other questions to be asked, but uh, perhaps those can be dealt with at another place at another time. And it reinforces the enthusiasm I have always had for doing a joint webinar with the wonderful Defence and Security Forum uh, and Olga Maitland. And it rests to me on behalf of the Asia Scotland Institute to thank Doug Cook for putting this together and also to, uh, to, to thank all of you for participating. And of course, um, the question is, can Britain afford not to trade with China? And that's the interesting thing on which um, we're going to ask you in a poll for your reaction. So to all of you, thank you very much indeed. And thank you for your extremely helpful comments.